Thanks for joining the Abide YouTube channel. For more information about Abide, go to AbideChurchFL.com and enjoy today's message. I woke up this morning, and when I woke up this morning, I was getting ready, and to be honest with you, I had about four messages. I was like, I, I was like, I don't know what exactly, God, you want me to communicate, but I did hear this this morning. As soon as I woke up, I was getting ready to come and preparing my daughter, and I heard the Holy, I heard the Holy Spirit say this to me, I will have my bride. I will have my bride. I will have my bride. And I know there's been lots of images that have been portrayed of God, but what I hope to do this morning as we go on a little journey together is to remove the pressure, to remove the weight. I believe God is wanting to remove, to deliver us. Say deliver us. He is wanting deliverance to happen in his body from the need to measure up. Especially in circles like this where we just spent an hour contending. You see on the back wall, we have post, we on the back wall plastered revival. And we're believing God for a lot. It is important for you to know that it has very little to do with you. That it all started with him. It's all sustained by him. And it will be accomplished by him. We, we co-labor with the Lord. I understand this. God wants us to be active in our faith. But the moment it begins to start or originate with us, we begin to do things in the flesh that never had anything to do with him. In the name of the Lord. And so what I'm seeing in the body as a whole is we, we've come under this yoke where we begin to believe that the more we perform by God, the more we can be loved by him. And what it does for people that are broken, people who, who don't know what it looks like to step into religiosity or to put on a mask, is they immediately become disqualified. So like the moment I first walked into church, I was 18 years old, and I've heard about the Lord my whole life. Grew up, my, my, my grandparents were Seventh-day Adventists, so I always knew about God, but I had no relationship with Him. And so I found myself five years of different forms of addiction, whether it was drugs or pornography, you know, I was addicted, but I came in to know Jesus, but I had this problem. I knew that I met the Lord, I knew His love had touched me, but I wasn't as good as everyone else around me. And so I spent years dealing with this shame, this guilt, and this feeling of maybe if I just do more. And then finally I hit this moment of barrenness, right? This, this like wall where, where I had to come to the realization, and you should ask yourself, how many healings is enough healings to be loved by God? Come on, how many words of knowledge? How many people do you have to get saved to be accepted by Him? Who told you that you save people? You understand all the things that we've been taught? And what I believe God wants to do is he's removing the yoke, the pressure of having to perform to be loved by God. It doesn't mean that we don't do anything. It doesn't mean we become a blob like, oh God, you love me. And I'm, it doesn't mean that. But it means that love, intimacy becomes the motivator. It becomes the end, the fuel that allows you to go and to be sustained. There's no amount of money. Let's remove, let's remove Christian, let's remove ministry. There's no amount of money. There's no amount of recognition. There's no job that will be able to sustain you in the place and the purposes of God. That's why Jesus spoke to us very plainly, right? I, I love this. When Jesus describes himself as living water, he knew that every single one, one of us would understand the concepts of thirst. You can go a pretty long time without eating food, but a very short amount of time without drinking. And so God fabricated us. You got to think about it. He fabricated you from the very beginning, and he put the concept of thirst inside of you, knowing one day his son would stand and say, I am living water. And you would understand, I need that. That he would, he would introduce himself and he would not only say, I'm living water, but when you drink from me, you will never thirst again. And he made it a really clear indicator, when I find myself dry and thirsty, I'm not drinking from him. It's clear. It's clear. And what he wants to do, he wants to betroth himself to you. 
He, he, this is what he wants for you. I, I'm trying to help you because maybe you've seen Master Jesus as teacher and he's teacher. Or you've seen him as Lord and he's Lord. He's all of those things, but he is also your husband. And until you understand him as husband, everything else just kind of gets out of whack. Now, I know some of the guys in the room are like, bro, I can't get with it. I don't, <laughs> too manly for that. But you have to understand that he, he orchestrated it this way, right? In Ephesians 5, he begins to talk to us about the husband and the wife. And he's describing this thing about submission and passionate love. And he's describing this relationship. But at, at the end, he says, this is the divine mystery. That this relationship would speak to you about the kingdom. Yeah. About the way me and you were supposed to engage with one another. And so some of you are like, well, I'm just tired of doing it. It's so exhausting. I, I get it. Because it wasn't meant to be that way. You can only get so far without drinking from him. You could only get so far without engaging. I'm not even talking about in church. Because I'm not the living water. Worship is not the living water. You could be in environments and you can be around a lot. But until you engage your heart with his. You're going to be thirsty. So in Haggai, Hosea, sorry, Hosea 2. This wasn't even a part of my message, but I'm going to read it. Hosea 2.14. If you want to turn there, Hosea 2.14 is Old Testament. It says this, listen. But then I will win her back once again. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about God's people, right? They were a wayward people that had, they had gone away in idolatry and they had married themselves to everything but God. And he's talking about bringing them back because this is his desire. What does God want for you? This is the question. What does God want for me, from me, to be married to you? To be one with you? To be in union with you? Before you do anything for him? To be married to him? But then I will win her back once again. Say that to me. He's trying to win you. He's trying to win you. I will lead her into the desert. And I will speak tenderly to her there. The desert wasn't a place of punishment. It was a place of isolation. It was a place of privacy. You got to watch your lens. It wasn't like he was barren. No, he wanted to take her by himself to be one-on-one -on -one with her. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. Listen to me. I will return her vineyards to her. This was life, sustenance. This was fruit. And transform the valley of trouble. How many of you have ever been in a valley of trouble? Just me? Four of us. Great. Well, y'all need to lay hands on us. All y'all who've never been there. <laughs> wow. He will transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. That word hope means expectation. Something to be yearned for, anticipated eagerly. Something one awaits. She will give herself to me there. So watch this. He calls her. He leads her to a private place. And this is a transformation. There's a transference. This is what happens when you say yes to Jesus. You got to understand true discipleship is a dispensing of one kingdom into another. It's not a six-week class. It's a replacement of an old kingdom into a new one. And she will give herself to me there as she did long ago when she was young. When I freed her from her captivity in Egypt. I don't care where you are, where you come from. You've all been delivered. If you've said yes to Jesus, you have been delivered from a captive place. The issue now is trying to help you to not go back there. When that day, when that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me. What does it say? When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O oh Israel, I will wipe away the many names of Baal from your lips, idolatry, and you will never mention them again. And on that day, I will make a covenant with you and all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground, they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land and all swords and bows. He's saying he's going to keep you in safety. Then verse 19, I will make you my wife forever. I will make you my wife forever. Showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine. And you will finally know me as the Lord. 
This is super important. When I read the scripture, my first initial thought is, why didn't somebody share this with me in 2008? I understand grace. I understand that the self, I understood that I, I was messed up. I understood that I was angry. I understood that I was an addict. But I needed to understand that he not only was my Lord, he was my husband. Yeah. Yeah. That he was committed to me. This is what's important about this. You need to understand that he is everly committed to you. He is everly pursuing you. In my marriage, because I'm in covenant with my wife, we have this rule, right? No matter how hard things get, we will never say the word divorce. That wasn't always that way, but we just realized that we live in a culture where when things get hard, it's easy to just say, I'm going. Yeah, come on. I'm going. And so about six years in, it took us a long time. Maybe it was less, four or five, I don't know. <laughs> she always corrects, I don't know. But we just had to make a decision because it used to be that way. Well, you don't like, you want to do things that way, I'm leaving. I'm taking my bag. And then I used to be like, where are you going to go? <laughs> Which would not help things. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to We have one car. I have the keys. You're not going in a walk? <laughs> you understand things get really messy? But that's the way we view our relationship with God. The moment that we're doing, the moment we're on evangelism and we're reading the word every day and we're in the right community, we think God is glad with us. And then the moment that we step out, because at some point you're going to make a mistake. This is the issue. At some point you're going to get frustrated. At some point you're going to be disappointed. At some point, things aren't going to play out the way you thought they were going to play out. And then when you respond because of your expectation not being met, all of a sudden, God has left you. This is not the gospel. You need to see God as everly pursuing you. You need to see him. Listen, he is a jealous lover. I got to read more scripture because you're disengaging. The Bible will help bring you back. Oh, man, I'm excited. I love you guys so much. Man. This is 2 Corinthians 12. This is Paul speaking, and he's speaking about this thorn that's in his side. And he's, this, it, was, it was an inconvenience that was happening in his life that he was asking the Lord to get rid of because he felt like it was bringing him weakness, right? And we all have weaknesses. How many don't have weaknesses? We all have weaknesses. We all have where we're working this thing out. And then he says this, the Lord, the, the Lord said to him, my grace is always more than enough for you. This is the TPT, I love this. My grace is always more than enough for you. And my power finds its full expression through your weakness. Come on, how many of you view your weakness in that light? Because we tend to like, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to see that. I don't, I'm not saying that we embrace immorality and sin. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when we fall short in your weakness, that your weakness actually attracts the Lord. I'm serious about this. I'm serious because the, the opposite side of this is every time you fall short, you fall into shame, condemnation, guilt, and isolation. And you start beating yourself up thinking that you're going to med, like that's your grace journey. Where, where's the scripture? Put it up in the back. I'm excited about it. I'm on my tippy toes. <laughs> it's back there, I promise. 2 Corinthians 12. My grace, yes. My grace is always more than enough for you and my power finds its full expression through your weakness. So I will celebrate my weaknesses for when I am weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. So I'm not defeated. Say, I'm not defeated. I'm not defeated by my weakness, but delighted. I want you to understand that no matter where you find yourself, I had a family member one time that we were praying and, and he was a drug addict for probably 20 years in a very religious system, and we were talking about fasting, and the, the guy actually, in the midst of his addiction, went on, I think, a seven-day fast, and as he was fasting, he was talking about praying to God, and somebody sitting around the table says, God doesn't hear you, and I was sitting there. I was just so offended. I was like, oh my, <laughs> you know, God doesn't hear you because you're an addict. 
And the moment that happened, I, I, just, I just couldn't take it. It was like a, maybe 30 seconds, you know, sometimes 30 seconds can feel like an hour. And I was like, I want to say something. I think that God hears him more than he hears you. Yeah. Now we all clap about, we all clap. But when it comes that we're the person in the attic seat, yeah. we're the person going through the dysfunction, through the marital issues, through the poverty, through what, it's very difficult for us to believe that. See how quickly it goes from a clap to, holy crap, he's right. But, but the perspective shift, and, and it's really, it's on us, right? It's not God. God is not, listen, the dysfunction is never on God's side. If you feel separated, if you feel, it's never on his side. It's a perspective thing. It's like choosing in, in the moments of weakness when I feel frustrated, when I feel angry, when I feel disappointed. Let's talk about disappointment for a minute. Listen, how you navigate disappointment is monumental. Because many times God will speak certain things to us, and as soon as he speaks, we have a narrative of how it's going to play out. Come on, their story, the story of Joseph is a great example. You're going to be a great person one day, and then he's in a pit, then he's in a prison. Because things rarely play out the way we think they're going to play out. And so in reality, this journey of engaging with the Lord is a, what, what is it about? About how I steward my heart along the journey. Can I continue to feed on the faithfulness of the Lord? Can I continue to remind myself of all the things that he's done? Can I delight? Don't take it down anymore, please. <laughs> I love you, Kaylee. Can I continue to be delighted in my weakness? For when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, when, oh, sorry, for when I feel my weakness and endure mistreatment, for when I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face, boom, next one. Nope, it's not up there, okay. When I'm surrounded with troubles on every side and face persecution, because of my love for Christ, I am made yet stronger. <laughs> Listen to how he ends this. For my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. like, listen, properly managing dysfunction, properly managing disappointment, discouragement, when properly allowing God to speak into that place, it becomes a portal to his power. Some of the revelations that we, that we, that we cling on today, the greatest, right? Like when, when we talk about God is Jehovah Jireh, he's provider, we forget that that revelation came on the backside of a guy almost killing his son. See how it gets quiet? Sometimes we ask God, God, I want favor on my life. Listen, the favor of God on Noah looked like him looking crazy for 100 years. Mary was favored, but everybody thought that she had slept with Joseph before she was supposed to. And if we don't keep proper perspective in the journey and we don't allow God to speak to us in this place, we come under this yoke. It's one of the things that's killing the church the most, this comparison thing. I should be further along. Really? Who told you that? Who told you you should be further along? This was a trap for me, man. When I first got saved, I would dedicate hours upon hours of reading the word. And then things happen and, I, and it wasn't the same. And the, the trap the enemy would use for me time and time again is you should go, but you should be doing that again. And finally, the Lord said, hey, listen, seasons change. It's summertime. I'm not going to wear a coat. It's hot outside. And we constantly come under these accusations. And the voice of the enemy that's saying, you should be doing more. See, some of y'all are already disengaged. You're like, I got this. No. No, you really don't. You really don't. The reason you feel tired, the reason you feel blah, is because you're living under a religious spirit yoke. That is not allowing you to be free to love Jesus. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You need to be free to love the Lord. I want to read to you another scripture. It's about that time, right? James 4. Are you okay? What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way? Did you hear that? 
your need to have your own way is causing inner conflict. It's not the church. I just don't get fed there anymore, bro. It's not that. You just have a need to have your own way. And fulfill your own desires. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. So you have, you have these desires that are of your own. You begin to put yourself above other people. This, how many of you know this is an issue? It's an issue. You scheme with envy and harm to others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and you fight. And all the time you don't obtain what you want because you won't ask God for it. And if you ask and you won't receive it for your asking with corrupt motives, seeking only to fulfill your own selfish desires. We don't preach that a lot in the charismatic church. Hey, what if the reason you're not getting answered to your prayers because it's not God's will for your life? Okay, I'll move on. Verse four hits. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair, an unholy relationship with the world. <laughs> I know, it's, it's been four weeks. But that's what he said this morning, right? I will have my bride. You have become spiritual adulterers who are having an affair an unholy relationship with the world. Don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God? Whoever chooses to be the world's friends, the world's friend makes himself God's enemy. Does the scripture mean nothing to you that says that the spirit that God breathed into our hearts is a jealous lover? who intensely desires to have more and more of us. But he continues to pour out more and more grace upon us. For it says, God resists you when you are proud, but he continually pours out grace on the humble. So then he gives us an answer. Like the Bible is so good. So then, because you've been in adultery, because your hearts have grown cold, because you've fallen in love with the lust and the passion of the world, so then, surrender to God. Yes. Repent. Turn. Surrender to God, stand up to the devil and resist him and he will turn and run away from you. Either that's true or it's not. Move your heart closer and closer to God and he will come closer and closer to you. Did you hear that? Man, move your heart closer and closer to God and he will come even closer to you. But make sure, say but. but. <laughs> this means like, before you move, like, right? He's saying move your heart. But before you move your heart, make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners, and keep your hearts pure and stop doubting. Feel the pain of your sin. Be sorrowful and weep. What is he saying? Be connected with what's really going on. That's why I believe you saying words. Oh, man. That's why I believe that salvation has to be more than saying a manuscript. Saying five sentences doesn't mean you're getting into heaven. Amen. We cleanse our lives, and the only way to cleanse your life is by coming to the cross. It's, it starts with the surrender push, portion, right? You can't cleanse you. How many of you know that by now? You can't cleanse you. You can't make you right. So we surrender to God, and we come to him, and he cleanses us. And he removes, but then it is our job to keep, our, to keep ourselves yoked to him to remain pure. It's the only way, church. I'm trying to help you. Because you're like, well, I said yes to Jesus. Well, now if I join a small group. No, a small group can help. If I say yes to Jesus, I'll come to prayer room. And then, no, prayer room will help. But until you understand that you are married to the Lord... Man, some of you who are married, could you imagine you got married tomorrow and then you're like, hey, yo, I'll see you next Sunday. I'll see you next Sunday from 10 to 12 and we'll do everything we have to do. Then we'll be intimate. And then I'll see you next week. Could you imagine that kind of relationship? What God is calling us, what, what, what is intimacy? Intimacy has very little to do with sex. 
Intimacy has to do with information. It's an opening up of the heart. It's allowing God into those places. We were talking about this in pre-service and in, in, in huddle today. We were like, man, what we believe the Lord really wants to do is he wants to, us to allow him into the darkest places of our hearts. Like, I don't have any dark places. Then why, are you, then why do you feel the way you feel? John 10, 10, I have come to give you life and life in abundance. And the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. So if you feel like something's stealing, destroying, causing chaos in your life, there's an area of your life that needs deliverance. We don't deal with this anymore. I know we don't deal with this because we want to gloss over it and talk about revival. But God pours out his spirit on a holy, clean container. It has to be this way. It's for, it's for you. It's for you. Because we're asking God for things that if he really gave it to us, it would crush us. And at the very same time, if you're here today and you feel broken, you feel, you feel discouraged, disappointment, you have to know God is ready and he still says, I do. Yes. Not fix yourself. He says, I do. Before the foundations of the earth, he knew when he said, I do. You're like, well, what about my addiction? I'm going to say it. What about it? What about it? My addiction had to die at the altar. Yes. The reason we have continued addiction is we have too much pride. We won't come to the altar. Yes. Well, Jesus, if you want to touch me, you can touch me right here. That's great. But where we're going as a church, it's, not, it's going to take more than that. Yes. Blessed are the hungry and the thirsty. Have you ever seen a hungry person? I know it in America it's rare. Because we go from one full belly to the next. But in a culture in third world countries, hunger is desperation. And desperation will lead you to hunger. And this is what he's looking for in the church. To divorce yourself from the world. You can't be married to God and the world. I'm sorry, you can't. You can't do it. He's a jealous lover. And some of you, you've thought, God, he's trying to, to take things away from you because he's legalistic. It's love. Love requires all. Love covers all. Yes. So I'm not going to love them on Sundays and Wednesday nights and then live however I want throughout the week. Yes. I'm going to come into covenant family, which is you. You are covenant family. And I'm going to be honest and vulnerable and raw. And I'm not going to pretend like I have it all together, but I will be hungry. I will be desperate because I know in that place, he'll meet us. He'll meet us in that place. He's faithful. But I believe he's wanting us to draw close to him. I believe he's wanting us as a people to take off the masks. Man, it's so damaging to you. It's so damaging, and it's got to be exhausting. Who gives a crap what anybody thinks? I'm serious. It's time for us as a people to engage heart to heart with the Lord. And when I read to you in the beginning about him taking a people and putting them in a desert, it can happen for you today. He's wanting to engage with your heart and he's wanting to cleanse you, to restore you. He wants to love you. Yeah. You know what he was saying, um, I just felt the need to share just briefly you know, vulnerability is when you're being vulnerable, it's me sharing something that you can use against me. So most of the time we say vulnerability is just me sharing. That's not the case. It's literally sharing something that you can then later be like, you are this because I heard you say. And there was a moment in our marriage, he was talking about this, who cares what people think? We were pastors at a very large church and this woman gave this altar call 
And he begins to look at me and she said, there's someone's marriage in this room that needs healing right now. It's on the verge, you're on the verge of divorce. And I was like, don't you dare, don't you dare move. I was leading worship and I, and everyone knew there was about 700 people there. And I was like, don't you do it. And I, I was avoiding eye contact and then I saw him standing at the altar and he was crying. And I was like, no, 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 no. And he said, come, come stand. I was like, but the people can't know our marriage is broken. The people of the church can't know that we're broken and we're, we're about to leave each other. And I ended up walking to the front and the Lord completely restored our marriage in a moment, in a moment of vulnerability where everyone could say, look, they're broken. Look at what's going on in their marriage. Look what they're saying. Look what's happening here in a moment. But the Lord took our vulnerability of saying, God, I don't care what it looks like right now. I am so desperate. And that is what the church needs. I don't care. I am so desperate to get free. I need healing. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it costs me friendships. And I don't really care if you use this against me later on. I need your healing, Lord. I need your healing and I'm desperate enough to do whatever it takes. And I don't care if you've got nasty things to say about me. I need to know what the Lord is saying in this moment over my situation. Well, thank you. I remember that day, Marsha Woolley was speaking. And when the moment she started speaking, I was like, that's for me. And I've just always kind of been this way. I'm like, I, if God's about to do something, I care less. So I remember she was looking this way. And I'm standing, I'm like, come, come on. <laughs> She's like, no. But sometimes we, I think now, man, what would it have been like if I would have thought, I can't go up there, I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on staff. How many moments do we miss? You know, sometimes we come into church, no matter how, no matter how zealous you are, there's going to come a moment of disappointment. And the lowest ministering to me this week, as I was reading through the upper room discourse, and, and it was talking about Peter. And then I heard a podcast about Peter making the declaration when Jesus was, he was washing their feet. Do you remember this? He was washing their feet. And Jesus says to Peter, you can't go where I'm going. And Jesus and Peter's like, why? I would die for you. He's making this bold in front of everyone. I would die for you. I would never, I would never go that way. And then Jesus says to him before the rooster crows, you would have denied me. And he finds himself by a fire. But then Jesus makes this statement after he speaks to them. He says this, do not let your hearts be troubled. And this is one of the keys, man. Keeping your heart tender, soft, and vulnerable. And not allowing despair, discouragement, and accusations to come into that place. So Peter standing by a fire. He denies the Lord. They make eye contact, right? It says in the Bible, they made eye contact. And now he's riddled with shame. Because he goes from saying, I would die for you to denying him. But then I love the intentionality of the Lord. Because he, he goes and he claims death, hell, and the grave. And then the disciples are fishing. And Peter had let the shame of disappointment lead him back to the very thing God had taken him from. That's where he met the Lord, with fishing nets. And so Jesus shows up on the water. This is super important for someone. Jesus, Jesus is standing by the water but they don't recognize him because this is what discouragement and disappointment and hopelessness does. It stops you from properly hearing the voice of the Father. And so then John says, it's him. It's Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat and Jesus is sitting around a fire. Do you see the intentionality of God rebuilding Jesus rebuilding the very place of his greatest shame moment and restoring him there. And 
And then he asks him, Peter, do you love me? And what's interesting is he says, Peter, do you agape me? I didn't even hear this till this week. It was actually on a podcast. Do you agape me? And then Peter goes, you know I love you, but he used a different word. It was phileo. So, so Jesus like, do you love me with, 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 with a love? Like agape is the greatest form of love because I love you with a brotherly love. And he asked him again, do you love me? You understand in the, in, the, in the greatest moment of his vulnerability, he didn't ask him, will you be a great disciple? Will you preach many sermons? He's wanting to know one thing, do you love me? And for some of us, God is taking us right back to that place. What if nothing changes? Do you love me? Will you start with this? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to invite, I'm actually going to invite Prophetic Company up. We have people that are going to be up here, they're going to pray. But I actually just want to invite anyone up that needs, hey, Mike, we're going to pray for you. Let's just do that right now before we do. Mike, come up. Mike has some stuff going on in his stomach that they're, they're, they're saying could be cancer. We just don't agree. We don't agree. We just don't agree. So we're just going to pray as family right now. He came today. They actually wanted him to go to the ER, and he's here with faith. So can we just stretch our hands right now? We've seen just a few weeks ago, God healed blind eyes. God can do anything. So, Father, we thank you for Mike. Father, we bless him with health. And, Father, we bind every tumor. Everything in his body, Father, that is not from you, we just bind it right now in Jesus' name. We speak against doubt, discouragement, hopelessness, and we thank you that by your stripes we are healed. By your stripes we are healed. We declare the blood of Jesus over you right now. It cleanses, it cures. You see him, God. You see him, God. With tears in his eyes this morning, he says, I trust you. Father, we declare good reports over him. You've done it before, you'll do it again. You've done it before, you'll do it again. Jesus. 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 Hey, listen, as, here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up the altars. They're, they're going to spread out as they pray. I just want to encourage anyone in here that you felt that discouragement, disappointment, or God needs to restore it, just come up to the altars. Find a place. Just find a place. I had to do it with my wife. And time and time again, I still have to do it. I just encourage you, even now, even now, just find a way, yeah. And they're going to pray and just agree with you. Maybe you just need to find your own place in the altar, but there's no pressure. As the Lord draws you, just come. But don't remain in that place.